the uh, William McElhaney lecture series was uh, uh, founded on behalf of William McElhaney, who was the founding president of the National Groundwater Association uh, in 1948. And uh, this lecture series was begun in the year 2000 to uh, uh, provide a platform for uh, more of the practical side of the well industry to share its knowledge and uh, activities and, and uh, uh, things with the industry. Mr. McElhaney, uh, of course, founded the National Groundwater Association as a platform for co <coughs> contractors and professionals to get together and to share information and uh, seek to, to better the industry. So uh, uh, that's what this series is all about. The way the NGWA selects speakers like myself to participate in this is annually they'll get together with a, a panel and uh, come up with a name of individuals that uh, 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 they think they'd uh, uh, nominate to participate in this series. And that's how they came to me. Uh, this this uh, series is underwritten uh, by Franklin Electric Company. They began this in uh, May of 2005. Of course, I think most of you in the industry know who Franklin Electric is. And uh, we're indebted to them to make travel uh, and underwrite things that allow me to get around and share my experiences with, with people like you. So we're indebted to them for uh, underwriting this event. When the uh, NGWA contacted me to uh, uh, participate in this, they, of course, asked me. I'm, I'm the director of sales and marketing with Johnson Screen, been in this industry for a number of years as both a contractor, uh, spent some time as a consultant, been with Johnson Screen since 1983. So I've got an uh, extensive experience in the industry, and they asked me to come up with a topic, and what would I like to talk about? And over the years that I've been in this industry, uh, uh, I've been involved with drilling and construction, but well development came up as a topic that I said I'd like to share more thoughts on and ideas uh, because to me it's one of the most important aspects of the process of drilling and completing a well. I came up with a title, said, well, you, got, you know, we need you to have a title as well as a subject. So. I came up with you drill a hole, but you develop a well. There's a lot of holes drilled in the ground for various purposes, but when you're looking for water production, uh, development is, is a key. So uh, when we talk about life cycle of a well, uh, basically you construct a well, you use it for whatever purposes it's designed for. Uh, during the useful life, maintenance and rehabilitation uh, can get involved, and then at some point in time you're going to abandon that well. So in looking at the development phase, construction, I've been involved with those aspects, uh, design, installation, development, and testing. Those are the processes for building a well. And I've singled out well development to focus on for this, for this talk. So what we're going to talk about here as far as well development is, is just kind of take it apart and look at what is it, why do we do it, what impacts well development, how do we do it, what are some of the processes, when are we done with it, how do we pay for development. These are some interesting discussions I've had with other groups uh, uh, and we'll expound on that because how that can affect development. And then what are the benefits when we wrap up? And at the end of the talk, I'll have, uh, uh, I've got about four uh, case studies that will review various types of wells and various types of uh, development methods that were used. So what is well development? Well development, to, to give it a definition, I, I think everybody, uh, every audience I've talked to, we all understand well development, we all do it, but to give it a definition, I, I said it's the intentional application of select mechanical techniques, often with chemistry, to remove drilling damage and restore or enhance near well hydraulic characteristics. So that's what the process is. Why do we do it? As I began to get into this talk and, and uh, 
started to think about what I wanted to say was, well, okay, why do we, why do we do the development process? Well, first of all, I think we do it because drilling changes things. The process of drilling the hole uh, disturbs the natural conditions and introduces fines and fluids and basically alters uh, the geology and the hydraulic conditions, especially when we're looking for uh, uh, water production or sampling or something like that. So drilling changes things, so we have to correct that. Secondly, I think we do it because we're trying to achieve some original design expectation. This could be, uh, depending again on the purpose of the well, this could be sand control, uh, this could be to enhance yield depending on the type of the well and maximizing specific capacity or it could be uh, uh, for an intake well or injection well, those kind of purposes. Or it could be if the well's specific purpose is for sampling, uh, making sure that we get the quality of samples that we're looking for. So in other words, some sort of a design expectation. Thirdly, I, I began to wander off the obvious, and I, I'd like to think as an industry we do it because we want to deliver a quality product. We want to have an efficient well uh, and, and efficiency. We'll be talking about this off and on through the talk, especially toward the end, but efficiency is defined as, uh, for production wells, it's defined as the theoretical drawdown divided by the actual drawdown. This is the measure that the industry has used for years to measure efficiency. And we'll come back to this later, but I think, to me, development uh, really impacts this. So talking about what affects well development? What are the processes that we go through and the things involved with well construction that have, can have an impact on well development itself? When I began to think about this and, and have asked audiences, there's some real obvious things that come to mind, and I listed five of them here, and we'll look at each one of these individually, but the drilling method, the type of drilling apparatus we're using, the geology, Okay, we'll talk about how does the geology affect well development. Drilling fluids, how can they impact it? Screen type and type of completion. I think these, these are pretty obvious things that come to mind. As I began to think this through, what other kind of things can impact well development? Well, to me, obviously, expertise of the people involved, people that are on site, or people that have written the specification or are there to oversee the job. And another thing is the contract. We'll talk about that. Uh, I've definitely seen contracts, especially in municipal wells and industrial applications to where the contract itself can have an impact on the outcome. It just nagged me for a little bit. I said, there's got to be something else that, that uh, can affect. Sure enough, Murphy's Law. We'll talk a little bit about how, you know, we're only human and, and we build all our own apparatuses and there's things that can happen on the job site that, that can also affect well development. So let's, let's talk about all these. The drilling method. Now, depending on whether you're uh, using rotary, I don't care what, what type of rig, but whether it's rotary, casing advance uh, method of some sort, uh, cable tool drilling methods, augers, all of these techniques, they're all going to, to some degree, they're going to crush and rearrange, they're going to fill voids, uh, and basically change the hydraulic characteristics. So the drilling method is, is the process that really disturbs the geology and to a greater or lesser degree. So I, th I think that's pretty obvious. With rotary methods, we've, as an industry, we've done a lot over the years to, uh, I, I was involved with a uh, panel about three years ago that was looking at advances that we'd made in the industry in the last 20 years. Well, certainly to me in the realm of tools to drill holes with. Uh, we've made a lot of advances with the types of bits, the types of rigs, and so forth. 
a lot of advancements to drill holes faster and, and uh, uh, those kind of things. The thing where I don't think you see a lot in the industry today, and I've talked to several audiences, is, is a lot of tools that have to do to make the development process better. But things like this, specialized rotary tools that uh, downhole hammers, uh, uh, won't spend a lot of time on these, but uh, different things to drill cleaner, faster, straighter, uh, these all exist, uh, again, to advance casing uh, for different types of geology so that you won't have to use as much in the way of drilling fluids. We'll take a look at a case study at, at the end of this uh, presentation that involves a drilling method like this where, where again, you had some effect on, on development. Uh, auger tools, depending on large augers for shallow holes uh, or hollow stem augers for uh, uh, environmental and monitoring wells, all of them to a greater or lesser degree are going to disturb the formation. So uh, any type of drilling technique is, is going to have an impact. Now this particular slide here I've, I've always apologized to audiences for, but uh, when talking about the geology and how the geology can affect well development, what this graph is on the right hand side of the slide is from left to right, you're looking at decreasing hydraulic conductivity of various types of geology. In other words, here on the left, you've got coarse gravels and sands, you've got uh, highly fractured type geology, so you've got high production uh, aquifers here to low production aquifers. So the general uh, concept here, and what I've learned over the years is that how does this affect uh, development? First of all, it may determine the type of completion, obviously, whether you've got an open hole, naturally developed well. But the biggest thing from a development perspective is it's probably going to affect the time that you're going to spend on the job and the method that you may have to use or methods in order to get it done. What happens here is, is my experience has shown as the more you get to this right hand side of the curve, in other words, the lower the producing formations, the, the less they're producing, the more the development process has to be done from the inside of the well out. You have to do the, the work from the inside out. The analogy I use here is we've all, we've all seen on TV the, uh, the films and videos of the, the floods, water racing down a canyon or the tidal waves that uh, uh, wash ashore and, and when you've got a lot of water moving, you've got a lot of mass moving. You can move cars and people and dogs and, and all kinds of things when you've got a lot of water moving. Well, the same concept can be true down in a well bore. If you're drilling in a very coarse gravel, river alluvium type environment and you put a pump in there and you can pump a thousand or several thousand gallons a minute out of that well, you're moving a lot of mass, you're going to get a lot of assistance outside the well in the development process. Consequently, if you're in a real tight sand, fine grain, low yielding, low specific capacity formation, you're going to have to develop that well from the inside out. So that can make a big difference in time and, and of course time is money. And uh, that's where sometimes contracts get involved in this. Drilling fluids. How does the drilling fluid? Well, certainly the uh, type of drilling fluid, and, and here again is an area where the industry has made a, a lot of advancements in the past 20 years from the standpoint of, of uh, developing higher quality synthetic polymers to drill with as opposed to natural bentonite clays and so forth. But the type of drilling fluid is, is going to, uh, uh, to a greater or lesser degree, affect the amount of, of damage you might inflict on the formation during the drilling process from uh, introducing uh, foreign, foreign things. Probably more key to the success or failure of the well as far as the drilling fluids is, is, is fluids management. How well do we manage those fluids? during the drilling process. And you'll notice I've, I've highlighted skill here. This, to me, this comes into play uh, as a major issue on the drill site. 
if you've got experienced people that understand uh, what can happen with drilling fluids and can manage those. By managing, I mean things like controlling solids and viscosity during drilling and essentially, uh, especially drilling with mud rotary, which is still a very popular uh, method today, keeping uh, uh, not so much an overbalanced condition and trying to be more an underbalanced condition. An awful lot of, of water well drilling is, is done in the overbalanced case where we've got uh, a holes full of mud and, and we're, we're maybe getting the mud too thick. That tends to put pressure on the well bore and tends to push everything into the formation. Those can cause you problems later on. So the more we can drill in an underbalanced environment, uh, you're not only going to have less damage, but you're going to get in, increased penetration and, and more efficiency out of the drilling process. The type of screen. How does the type of screen affect development? Well, first of all, what I've shown here is, is the four or, or five major types of screen apparatus that are used in the industry, uh, all the way from, from low uh, low configuration, low open area mill slot to high open area screen devices. Basically what, uh, and one of our uh, uh, case studies at the end of this is going to, we'll talk about uh, development versus screen geometry. But essentially the type of screen from a development perspective is going to dictate the, uh, the geometry is going to affect how we were uh, able to transfer energy from the inside to the outside. So that's going to have a big impact getting back to the type of geology we're drilling in. And uh, certainly as, the, as I pointed out, as the formation hydraulic conductivity decreases, we'll point out how you need more open area to deal with that. And how the development method itself should complement the type of screen device that you're using. Open area. Well, the more open area that you have, the less resistance to flow and the greater the access you're going to have to the formation. So again, uh, depending on the type of method, when we look at some of the methods with jetting, this makes it uh, especially effective. Uh, you can improve your success in, in lower permeability situations and it can save you time. And again, time is money. So a real, from, from my years in the industry, uh, I know there's been a lot of arguments presented that, well, we can have just as good a well with the lower open area device. That may be true. I've seen open area really come into play, not so much, let's say, from the initial new well construction, but when you have to go back into that well five or ten years later and, uh, and clean it or rehab it, open area then becomes an even greater ally in the picture because it means, uh, it means a lot in how much access you'll have to the formation. The type of completion, what I mean by that is, are we talking about an open hole, uh, natural gravel pack, artificial pack, or pre-pack? Those are the types of well completions that we have in the industry for, for wells. Uh, monitoring sampling wells, uh, basically those are more specialized well constructions where we're going to have issues like size that, that certainly is going to, a lot of monitor wells can still be two inch or less in diameter so you're going to have a limitation as to the type of tools that might be available. Uh, certainly with monitor wells you, you, have, uh, you may have restrictions on the type of fluids that can be used and certainly timing may, may come into play. But what I'm going to focus on are the pack type wells and uh, natural, artificial, and pre-pack because those are probably some of the most common methods that are used. So we'll take a closer look at those. First of all, from an uh, artificial gravel pack perspective, what we look at, uh, first of all, that can come into play and affect the development process is the quality of the pack itself. Are we talking about uh, uniform or non-uniform material? Uh, how round is it? How spherical is it? 
uh, and acid solubility. All these things uh, uh, can come into play. Most common uh, materials used today are natural sands. Uh, uh, again, uniformity and roundness. Uh, the more uniform and round and spherically shaped they are, the better. That's why I've listed up here also ceramic beads. We're starting to see more and more uh, usage of ceramic and glass beads in the industry because of their roundness and uniformity and sphericity. And uh, uh, in Germany, they're starting, uh, especially in prepacks, these, these types of material. But they're also looking at using glass beads uh, in Germany. There have been some well completions using pure glass beads in the conventional gravel packing process. Uh, certainly they're more expensive, but the uh, wells that have been done to date, the justification is there because they think they shorten the development time and they get a better production yield at the end of the day because they're using uh, a better materials. So those will probably gain in popularity. Thickness. How does the thickness of the gravel pack? Well, our uh, Johnson has always kind of preached thinner is better, and that, that's kind of our uh, basic rule of thumb. Three to four inches of material as far as an annular thickness is, is probably uh, uh, what's optimal. Uh, thicker, when you start getting thicker materials, you're going to have more difficulty developing through that and trying to place less than an inch, which is typical for a pre-packed screen, you just can't realistically do that in a conventional gravel pack. Nobody drills a perfectly straight hole and nobody can hold their tolerances like that, especially in deep wells, so uh, around three to four inches. Placement. How does the placement affect? Well, there's certainly many, many methods of placing gravel packs in wells, but uh, again, if you have a uniform gravel, if you're dumping it in or it's settling out over a long interval of the well, you're going to have less tendency for that gravel pack to segregate. So if you, if you have kind of a non-uniform gravel and it segregates on you, you're going to wind up with zones that are, that are coarser than others and you may have problems not only with development, but you may have problems with sand production. Whether or not you've got a clean filter pack, this can affect things because if you've uh, local source, it's the only thing you had and it, it's got debris and dirt in it when it goes in the well, chances are you're going to be putting that uh, debris down the well and that could be something that could plug off your formation. So having a good clean gravel is certainly better. Uh, how much gravel, the volume that you use, that's an indicator of the whole integrity that you've drilled. So if you've, most typical practice uh, on the site is to uh, pre-calculate the amount of gravel pack that's going to be needed for that job, typically to include like 20% overage or something like that. If in your uh, gravel packing process you uh, install your gravel and you're measuring that, and it doesn't come anywhere near where you think you should be with that uh, amount of gravel, then you know you've got irregularities in the well, you've got uh, washouts. Those particular areas could also be areas that you need to spend more time developing on uh, in the development process. So you need to be mindful of, of uh, uh, the volume and if everything goes according to plan. The speed with which you introduce the gravel pack. If you're dumping gravel in and, you, and you're, you're uh, introducing it very rapidly, you can cause differential pressures in the well bore, so you're going to wind up with overpressure. You may shove more of your drilling fluid back into the formation temporarily. This could cause things that can affect development. So the technique that you use. Pre-packs, typically, like I said, uh, they're a half to one inch thickness, and uh, this is a product that is particularly ideal for use when you're drilling in formations that will readily collapse around the screen once you start the development process. <clears throat> this particular slide shows a uh, kind of relationship to these factors I've said. This solid line over here to the right represents the borehole wall. 
So what we're looking at here is this represents roughly a 12-inch diameter screen. In a pre-pack scenario, this would be the location of your, of your pack, roughly no more than about an inch out away from the screen. The minimal that you can probably get away with, like I said, is in this uh, probably two to three inch range. That would be about the minimum that you could pack in the well. So optimum, we say, you know, out here about three to four inches. That's where uh, uh, optimum amount you can place in a well. We still see an awful lot of wells drilled today with up to eight inches of gravel pack. And Depending again on when I, I mentioned the geology, that can be a real disadvantage to develop through that much gravel pack uh, when it comes time. Pre-packed screens, again, here's a scenario where the, the diagram on the right, uh, uh, the, the advantages of a pre-pack, uh, certainly as you get a properly sized filter pack, you get uniform placement because it's already encapsulated within the screen. And what you're looking for is the borehole to collapse. So this diagram on the right simulates the uh, condition of the borehole right after you've put the screen in the well. Nothing has collapsed as soon as you, on the, uh, excuse me, on the left, on the right, as soon as you start the development process, the hole collapses against the screen. That helps to facilitate the breakdown of this uh, wall and mud cake. So uh, it's been uh, shown to be very effective in situations like that. Now, I bring up my issue of Murphy's Law. You know, certainly in, in, in uh, uh, I've always gotten several laughs out of the audience here when I've asked the question, you gentlemen that all out there drill wells and anything ever go wrong when you're on the job site? Well, of course it does. And uh, the, the thing, the point I want to make here in, in this talk is things are, they go wrong, they will continue to go wrong. We're not going to be able to avoid things like that is be mindful of when it happens. When during the drilling process do we have a problem? And a explanation of a scenario would be where we've got a, uh, a hole full of mud, but let's say we're drilling the upper casing zone. We're not drilling the pay zone. We're not drilling the aquifer, the production zone. If we have a problem then, we have a breakdown, we have a delay in the drilling process, the hole sits there full of mud, that's not going to probably make a big difference in the outcome of the well. It's going to hurt the pocketbook of the, the contractor because he's got to spend the extra money. But if, you're, if your breakdown happens right when you're drilling the aquifer zone, be mindful of that because it might, if you're, if you're days getting back up to speed and that hole's sitting there full of mud and you're right in your production zone, you may have to spend more time in order to get it to uh, developed and fix the damage done by the breakdown, again, that's where a contract can come into play. How's the contract structured? Are you going to get paid for that? Here's some examples. I've, I've got a couple of slides in here that, of course, show things that can go wrong. When, uh, in this case, gravel was, was dumped into the well and introduced way too fast, and you got this sudden downsurge, this dynamic load on the screen itself. This was a, a shallow well up in the state of Wisconsin. And what happened here was the load just crushed the screen. Uh, you know, it doesn't happen very often, but it, it happens. And uh, this is fixable. This uh, screen, as you can see, was recovered from the well. The well was cleaned out. Another screen was put in. The, the well turned out fine. It's just these are some of the things that happen. I threw this slide in because uh, this is when things really go wrong. This was a uh, uh, contractor in the state of Florida that was drilling in a karst topography and, and of course, had a, a giant washout and, and uh, uh, completely lost his, his rig and service truck into the well. This, this wasn't a result of a development issue, but I... Uh, you don't see too many slides like that. I wanted to throw that one in for effect. Contracts. I mentioned that early on. How can a contract uh, affect the development process? And uh, the, the things I've seen where the contract gets involved, some contracts, they might stipulate the method that should be used. Maybe that's the right method. Maybe it isn't. 
Uh, I've seen contracts stipulate the amount of time that would be spent. Well, maybe that's, uh, to me, that may be fine as long as that maybe is for bidding purposes only. Uh, I've seen a lot of wells drilled and a lot of development time spent per a contract, but really we weren't done developing yet. We needed to spend more time on it in order to wind up with a better well. So to me, these are things, uh, uh, and also maybe in these contracts, I mentioned the criteria for being done. When are we done with the development process? And, and payment. How is, how is the contractor to get paid if he's to do extra work? If we're going to deliver a, a better product to the owner, especially for large municipal wells uh, where they're putting out a, there's a huge investment in the cost of the well, I think Sitting down as an industry, I've proposed this in pl many places where I've given this presentation to uh, the time to discuss this is not out on the job site when something's going wrong. Uh, the time to discuss it is in your, your off-season meetings when you can get some groups together and discuss uh, problem jobs. When things went wrong, how can we address those from a contractual or a or maybe a better way that we can construct the specifications so that if these things do come up, there's a uh, realistic way and a fair way to deal with them. If we need to spend more time and you really need to have the contractor uh, do more, well then he needs to be paid for that. And uh, I think that would be a, uh, certainly a better value uh, add for the, for the entire industry. Let's take a uh, quick look through how we how we develop wells. Take a look at the methods that we use and because uh, I mentioned those with being able to uh, match the method with the type of screen. First of all, uh, all the techniques are designed to agitate and extract. In other words, these methods were all designed to go in there and agitate and bring out the fines and the drilling damage. So all the development techniques that are still used today are some form or fashion of these that I've listed. Bailing, pumping, surging, airlifting, and jetting. Uh, what has become more popular, I'd say, in the last 10 years is, is the introduction of chemical additives in the processes to aid in that in, uh, one of the most simple methods that is used today, uh, really typically in uh, small diameter house well type construction, is simple baling. And uh, most everybody's familiar with balers, so I didn't, I didn't even, couldn't even find a decent picture of a baler. But uh, it's uh, mostly used in small diameter wells. Requires certainly no additional power source. Uh, Typically in low yielding wells, it can give, also give you an indication of recovery. One of the uh, case studies at the end of this is going to talk about a, where we used a baler. And uh, the size of the baler itself can, can aid in the surging action. So baling is still a very uh, effective method that's in use today. Pumping, again, very fundamental technique. Uh, Typically, the uh, rates are, are, when you're developing using pumping, you're pumping at rates that are larger than what the design production rates are. Uh, a lot of techniques uh, are to backwash the well. That's where you'd kick the pump on and off. And uh, the, some of the drawbacks to this is you tend to develop the more permeable zones. There's no, uh, just having a pump sitting in the well doesn't isolate your your energy in any any particular fashion. Of course, some of the other things you need a temporary pump, so that's that means an added cost. And then, of course, pumping is usually a final uh, one of the final uh, steps in the process. Surging, surging. Now we're getting into more mechanical techniques, and this is where I've brought up some things to the industry 
uh, companies like myself. I said, you know, I mentioned earlier that we've made a lot of advancements in the realm of, of drilling tools and equipment and, and things to drill faster. The industry, I don't think, I think a challenge to the industry would be we need to come up with better tools uh, for the development work that needs to be done in wells. Most of the development tools that I run across out in the field have been designed and built by contractors. And I'm not downplaying those in any way, but uh, uh, they've done a very good job. But I think the industry uh, could, could get involved here and maybe look at better tools that could be developed for development purposes. Again, surging, we're forcing uh, uh, water in and out, and now we're looking at concentrating our, our energy over a more focused zone. And uh, most of you are familiar with surging. Again, here's typical surge tools. They're homemade devices. Uh, you can have a high risk of plugging in, in formations that have a lot of clay streaks. Uh, you need to be careful when you start swabbing a well and surging it, make sure that the screens are open. Make sure that you're not plugged so that you don't uh, create any uh, uh, excessive differential pressures. So again, our, our uh, advice to the industry is just start these processes slow, make sure everything is open and clear, and then you can begin to step up the, uh, step up the activity. Here's a method that I've seen used. Uh, it's surging with uh, more of a pneumatic technique. I've seen this used more for redevelopment purposes than development, but I wanted to uh, uh, expose everybody to it. It's simply a matter of, of capping the top of the well, and this method works best when you have uh, approximately two to three times the height of water above the screen that you have in, in screen length. So that you're, because what you're doing is basically uh, plugging the top of the well, shutting a valve at the top, turning on an air compressor, using compressed air to drive that column of fluid down uh, and out into the formation, and then opening up the valve, releasing the pressure, and allowing that water to flow back in. So what you're doing is using compressed air to surge a, a massive amount of fluid back and forth into the well bore. And again, when you're, this works very well when you're not, when you don't have an excessively long length of screen. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, probably less than 60 feet or something like that because once you get a whole lot of screen, you're, you're all your energy is going to be dissipated in the uh, first, uh, first few joints. But this can be a very, very effective technique uh, and very relatively inexpensive. And most drilling uh, contractors have the type of air on their drill rigs that can perform this uh, without too much uh, added expense. Another way to do this is to have a, a tank on the location. Uh, reservoir tank, I've seen this used where it uh, can be, in this case, full of fluid or, or have some water and chemistry. You're essentially, uh, I've seen these set up where even they're automatic. You can have them set up on a timer where a valve opens up, the fluid in the tank drains back in the well. As soon as it empties out, pump kicks back on, so you're basically cycling a volume of fluid in and out of the well bore. And, uh, this can be uh, a way of, of uh, uh, cleaning up a well or particularly cleaning up older wells and a, a good maintenance technique in the right situation. Conventional jetting tools. Now we mentioned jetting. As a, uh, this is a very popular technique, uh, very effective uh, when used uh, in, in the right way. Certainly when you have stratified aquifers, uh, it can be more effective because you're focusing your energy. It's good for breaking up mud cake close to the wall. Uh, you can jet with air or water. But it's most effective, as we've illustrated here, if you're uh, pumping the well at the same time that you're uh, jetting so that you've got a, a slight drawdown on the well bore so that as you're jetting out there and creating 
this energy to loosen fine materials and debris. They're being pulled into the well bore at the same time and removed. So that's the, uh, the whole idea behind the conventional jetting. A uh, conventional jetting tool setup is shown here. Uh, typically three or four nozzles, something to that effect. Uh, I'm sure most, uh, most of you have been around the industry, have been involved with some jetting technique. Uh, so uh, uh, I mentioned at the bottom of this slide, these are best applied when you're using a wire wrap screen in the completion process. And uh, one of our case studies at the end of this uh, presentation will talk about why that is. Uh, there's other types of nozzles that come into play for just pure air jetting where you can get higher pressures. Uh, this shows one that's made by Baskey Company. Uh, uh, these kind of tools, uh, certainly as you're jetting with these, any water should not contain any sediment, and the nozzles should be made of abrasive-resistant materials. But uh, again, just jetting with air, if, uh, if the nozzle is close to the inside diameter of the screen, you're, you're basically combining two techniques, you're jetting, and the fact that you're jetting with air, you're airlifting at the same time, so you're able to clean material out. So this can be a, a very popular technique. I threw in a couple of slides here of uh, just for uh, information. These techniques are are used more to redevelop uh, plugged wells than they are develop new wells. But uh, these impulse type generators, uh, what they do is basically create a shock wave down hole, and the uh, convention is that they will loosen. Uh, loosen and get material off the inside of the well. So essentially here what you're doing is you've got this apparatus down inside a screen area. You create a shock wave typically with compressed gas. What that wave does is, is go out and bounce back from the screen. My experience with these types of devices is they're very effective at cleaning the inside of the screen but not too effective at penetrating that far beyond the screen itself. So again, good for uh, maintenance work and, and those types of things, but if you've got a lot of material still in the formation beyond the screen, you're going to have to employ uh, uh, more technique. I threw in a slide here to show uh, uh, a lot of people sometimes wonder, well, can you really, can you really jet and develop through a, through a pre-packed screen? Uh, this is, of course, our, our Munipac screen, and uh, this is we set this up in a contractor's yard and shows a, just a, his jetting tool on the inside of the screen, and, and yes, you know how effective it is to jet through that because you're really only jetting through, uh, at the most, about an inch of packed material. Certainly the things that we mentioned here when you're jetting as you, as you get up to very high pressures, and we've seen people jet screens up to 10,000 PSI. That's not done very often, but it has been done. Certainly when you're reaching those kind of pressures, you need to uh, certainly have uh, use caution, uh, safety issues. But as far as the jetting process, you need to keep the tool moving and certainly keep from circulating sediments at the same time. Isolation tools. Uh, these are, uh, again, uh, the industry, I'd like to see the industry develop some, some better tools, more efficient tools, more sophisticated tools. I, to me, that's a challenge to the manufacturers in the industry to come up with some better things uh, for contractors to use. But here's the concept. It's to focus energy downhole. Uh, this is especially uh, valuable when you're doing deep wells because it saves trip time. You can combine techniques so you can inject as well as pump the well at the same time without having to trip out or change anything. And uh, typically you're focusing the energy over a small interval, something like five feet or uh, uh, a couple of meters or something like that. And you can employ the use of chemistry very easily. So. These types of tools are, are very effective. 
airlifting wells is another, uh, as I mentioned, uh, another very popular technique and highly recommend it for a well development technique because you can pump the well, you can pump debris, you can pump sand, and you don't have the issues with uh, damaging a pump and so forth. So airlifting is, is often a incremental step in the development process. It may be a, a, an early step or a polishing step depending, depending on uh, the type of aquifer that you're in. So there's uh, certain precautions you uh, need to be aware of. Obviously when you're airlifting a well you're unloading uh, pressure and water column uh, downhole and so again uh, go slowly Start slowly first, and then after you uh, uh, make sure that your screen device is open, there's no plugging down there, uh, then go ahead and, and get rougher and rougher with it. I used to tell a story about a project in, in North Texas years ago where contractor, uh, uh, again, Murphy's Law, he broke down during the drilling process of the aquifer and was down about four days. Uh, getting the rotary table fixed and back up operational to finish the development. They just kind of set the screen in place and we're going to start the development. And after getting it up, they kicked the compressor in too fast. The well had sat for those days. The mud had kind of congealed in the bottom of the well. They kicked the well on too fast and collapsed the screen. So it was a, a situation where uh, it went from bad to worse. So again, use caution and uh, there's certainly all types of uh, industry information available. Uh, I know this particular, this particular chart I borrowed from uh, just, just all kinds of information that tells you how to properly set up an airlift uh, program for the amount that you want to, uh, you want to pump. Chemicals. We mentioned chemicals. What what role do, can chemicals play in the development process? Well, pretty much uh, chemicals we found, uh, especially the use of things like chlorine and surfactants. Chlorine uh, is used, and we, we highly recommend it, when you're drilling with synthetic polymers or even bentonites that suggest that they're non-beneficiated, but most every bentonite on the market has at least some polyacrylamides in it. And uh, what the chlorine does is break down those polyacrylamides and that will assist in the process of breaking the, the bentonite material down and getting it released from the formation. So it's more effective in, by going in first, dosing the well with chlorine to break it apart and then go back in with your development uh, process. The use of, uh, I mentioned surfactants and wetting agents, these are, are added to uh, development uh, fluids just to aid penetration and getting back further into the formation. Phosphates, uh, we certainly don't recommend the use of phosphates anymore. They were used many years ago. Uh, effective at removing material, but a lot of times phosphates weren't cleaned out and flushed properly from the well and of course left behind they they certainly are a food source for bacterial growth so they'll promote uh, bacterial growth. There's products on the market that will will do a better job and not uh, promote any biological growth. And it's in, in our years of working in this industry uh, uh, we have it's it's not unusual I, I threw this in just to you know to 15, 20 year old well to find drilling fluids that weren't properly developed out of the well. So in other words, uh, again, development, you know, when are you done? Uh, uh, we've seen many a well that, that uh, should have had more work done on it. So that brings up kind of the question of when is a well developed? When are we, when are we done with the process? To kind of uh, get a better handle on that question, I threw a slide in here because development is, I mentioned efficiency early on and what we're trying to do is minimize the amount of drawdown that we're going to have in the well bore. 
and the drawdown is this component here and it's made up of several uh, components that add up to give you that draw, actual drawdown that you see in the well. First of all, we'll have head losses through the formation. These are going to be dependent on the geology. You're going to have head losses as you approach the well. You're going to have head losses as you uh, get into the well screen device itself, come through the borehole. So as we've described these various aspects of zones of head loss, all these add up to give you your component of drawdown. What I wanted to do was take a take a little closer look at this from a development perspective. So I put together a couple of simple slides here that that kind of illustrate what I think can sometimes happen in the process. What this slide represents here is a gravel pack well completion, a conventional gravel pack well completion right at the time where we're ready to begin the development process. In other words, this dotted line represents the uh, uh, let's say where the extent of the invaded zone is. Here's the borehole wall where we've got most of our mud cake or, or most of our damage has been done. The drilling process, if we've been in an overbalanced position, we've tended to migrate, especially in our aquifer zone. We may have migrated mud or fines into this zone. We've placed our gravel in here and our screen uh, and so forth and now we're ready to start the development process. So now looking at where those head losses are that create the drawdown, we've got the head loss through the aquifer. We've got a head loss through this invaded zone. Most of our head loss occurs right here at the borehole wall where we've uh, done most of our damage. And, and most of the alterations. So that's where you get the dramatic effect of the drawdown. Then you're going to have head loss across the gravel pack to some extent. You'll have a little bit of drawdown or a little bit of head loss coming through the screen itself. So all those added together give you this from theoretical to actual. So the development process is meant to take away as much of that damage as we can. So what we're looking to do is remove the material from the invaded zone, remove the damage that was done to the borehole face, and as we've kind of tried to illustrate here, if we remove all that or a great amount of it, we end up with this kind of actual drawdown. So this is the improvement that we've done from the development process. When I throw out the question of when are we done, I think uh, sometimes we may, if we've just spent a certain amount of time, we may have got this partially done. We may have moved some of this material from here to here, but depending on the thickness and the time and the method, we may not have gotten actually everything out of there that we think we have. Now in a non-gravel pack scenario, we've got the same, we've got the same setup. All that we have different here is we just don't have a a gravel pack between the screen and the borehole wall. So the losses uh, are the same and uh, the idea is here that potentially given the geologic conditions if we don't have that gravel pack to go through that's where I'm, I'm, I'm not saying gravel packs aren't proper but in the right scenario that uh, mention of thinner is better if you've got a situation where you don't need a gravel pack you can really get at the zone you need to clean up if you're working just right through the screen. So uh, give some consideration to potentially not even using a gravel pack. So when is a well developed? When are we done with the process? Um, I'm, I'm not here to answer that question precisely because I've, I think this is still something that the industry in, in certain extent is struggling with. This gets into some of this contractual issues and uh, payment issues, but is it when the contract terms are fulfilled? In other words, maybe in the, I've seen contracts where thou shalt develop the well for X number of hours and that's it. And could be, that's the way the contract written. 
Doesn't mean it's right, doesn't mean it's wrong. Is it when the turbidity is absent after we've uh, agitated the well uh, a certain time or a certain method and we're pumping the well and we're no longer getting any more debris out? Could be. Is it when the specific capacity stabilizes? When we no longer can see an improvement? Could be. Could be that we've only used one method and if we went to a different method we might get more out of the well. So again, that raises a question. Is it when uh, a predetermined efficiency is achieved? Now, we're seeing more and more contracts across the country written where efficiency is being written into the contract. For example, uh, in Texas, I've seen where they've got a good handle on a history in a well field so of the geology and production, and let's say they're able to to hit 70 to 80 percent efficiency, something like that, without too much difficulty in past wells. They might write a contract that says, uh, you bid the job, if you hit 80 percent efficiency, you'll get paid full value of the contract. If you hit 70 percent efficiency, you're going to be penalized. If you do a good job and hit 90 85 or 90 percent, you'll get a bonus. So we're seeing where uh, the, the issue that comes into play here is how do we measure efficiency in the field from a single well? And I think that's another challenge for the scientific community and the, and the contracting community to, uh, people talk about, uh, you know, conventional wisdom is in order to accurately determine well efficiency, you need observation wells and you need to have all this information on, on the aquifer. And I'm, I'm not going to dispute that, but when we're writing contracts and you got a contractor out there in a single well environment and there's money on the line and time on the line, the industry may have to come up with a method of determining efficiency from a single well that's, that's acceptable. And I think we'll, we'll see more of that. Because, again, well, the industry, I think, is striving to uh, deliver a, a better product. And by that, I mean a better efficiency. So maybe lastly is, is a well then fully developed when no further improvement can be obtained in the specific capacity and efficiency at a particular yield after you've maybe gone through two or three techniques of development and, and properly conducted. I, I think that's more getting to an answer. When you're talking about, this is a little trivia slide here, when we're talking about being uh, done with a well, a lot of states no longer want to see any sand production from a well. Some will allow two or three parts per million depending on the application. This is a quick and dirty way in the field if you pumping a discharge from a well and you fill a five gallon bucket and you've got about a dime's worth of sand left in a five gallon bucket, that represents about 10 parts per million of sand. When I talked about the industry challenge, basically I meant this again, going back, looking at well efficiency, we're talking about uh, how, how we're able to impact the actual drawdown. So when we don't have observation wells or that information readily available, how are we going to, you know, this is the way we do it now, but we generally this theoretical value comes from some study that was done or where we had observation wells employed. So I think that that is where maybe a challenge is out there for the industry to figure out how we can uh, determine efficiency from a single well. Over the years, uh, I did a, a little search of the uh, literature on, on uh, there's been a lot of study and, and certainly not going to get into all these equations, but there's been a lot of work done on measuring uh, head losses into wells and how those things impact drawdown over the years uh, and how some of those figures have been discussed as potentially ways to, to look at efficiency but uh, these are more studies of, in, in my opinion, more studies of uh, where the head loss is coming from as opposed to uh, pure efficiency. 
But the key thing in throwing all this up here is from a value add perspective is all of these equations have the component of drawdown in them. And if we're trying to ultimately as an industry deliver a, a, a more valuable product to the well owner, then the, the more we can do to minimize the drawdown in the well, that's going to directly correspond to lower pumping cost. And that's going to mean a better, more valuable product to the well owner. So.